In this, the seventh of our lectures on the Gospel of John, we will be addressing Jesus' last great discourse with his disciples. And it will be in the context of this discourse that he is going to give the very important teaching concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit. We make the transition to the book of glory from the book of signs. Uh, Jesus now has completed the last of the great signs, uh, which will be the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Uh, now he is going to come back to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he has entered into the city during the Passover uh, celebration, and he is going to be eating <clears throat> a last meal with his disciples. Uh, there will be some critical questions that we're going to address concerning this last meal. But in the context of this last meal, he's going to give this last discourse, which is the longest discourse in the Gospel of John. So let's talk first of all about some of these uh, kind of sticky interpretive questions concerning the last meal. All four of the Gospels describe Jesus eating a last meal with the disciples but they do so in a somewhat different way. The synoptics are going to be very similar to each other, but John's gospel is going to have some things that are not in the synoptics. And in fact, the synoptics will have some things that are not in the gospel of John. So what is common to them all is this farewell meal. All of them describe this. And in the context of that meal, all of them are going to describe Jesus' prediction that Peter will deny the Lord three times. And all of them will talk about them leaving the upper room and going to the Garden of Gethsemane. The synoptics, on the other hand, are going to not only describe disciples that are preparing the room for Jesus, they're going to describe the institution of the Eucharist with the actual actions of Jesus in which he gives thanks, he breaks the bread, he takes the cup, he gives thanks, and he gives it to them. And so those Eucharistic words and actions are not going to be found in the Gospel of John. Uh, on the other hand, what is in the Gospel of John is a description of Jesus washing the disciples' feet and him telling the disciples, I'm giving you a new commandment that you should love each other. And then there is this extensive teaching on the coming of the Holy Spirit or the paraclete. And we'll say much more about that as we go along. Another interpretive question has to do with why John seems to have the disciples leaving the room twice. When you get to the end of chapter 14, uh, Jesus is going to say, let's leave. Uh, but then you get to the beginning of chapter 18 and they actually leave. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, the traditional explanation is that Jesus did in fact leave the upper room uh, at the end of chapter 14. And so what happens in chapter 15, 16, and 17 is generally thought to have happened uh, somewhere in the street uh, between when they, when they leave the upper room and when they uh, cross the Cadron Valley. But that sort of leaves the first verse of chapter 18 hanging which uh, seems to suggest that they left at that time. Uh, sometimes historical critic scholars have suggested that uh, the Gospel of John is the stitching together of two independent traditions, probably both of them oral traditions, and each of them ending with a statement that the group left the upper room. Um, in all honesty, I don't find that uh, explanation very compelling. Uh, for one thing, uh, John was himself a witness of these events, so he didn't really need to depend upon uh, oral traditions that were already uh, within the community uh, of the early Christians. Uh, at least one uh, interpreter uh, who, who is uh, of, uh, quite a well-known scholar uh, a century or so ago is Rudolf Boltmann. Uh, he argues for a dislocation of the text, but Boltmann is arguing that the Gospel of John was not written in the first century by an eyewitness, but was written by uh, someone later in the middle of the second century. Uh, unfortunately for Mr. Boltmann, the discovery of the John Ryland's fragment of the John's Gospel, which dates to about 125, uh, pretty much uh, undermines his theory. Uh, but he did try to rearrange the last discourse, as you can see here. I think the simplest explanation is probably the best. In uh, the end of chapter 14, Jesus announces his intention to leave. 
but in fact, he doesn't actually leave until the beginning of chapter 18. Uh, there's nothing uh, uh, that uh, would injure the story or the narrative by that explanation, and it seems to be certainly natural enough. So that's the way I would, would suggest that we should read it. Another question is, why does John not include the institution of the sacrament? I mentioned that he does not have the Eucharistic words or actions of Jesus. And some of that, uh, 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 at least the way that you answer that question, is perceived by how you think John understands sacraments. Now, the fourth gospel doesn't have any explicit teaching about baptism and Eucharist. Uh, on the other hand, uh, because of that, some scholars have thought that perhaps John is anti-sacramental, that he feels like the church has gone too far in their uh, expression of the sacraments. I don't think that's a very compelling answer either, but I think what makes much more sense is that John is going to comment on the sacraments implicitly in the water events and the bread events of the fourth gospel. John is going to talk about water in which Jesus turns water into wine. He's going to talk about uh, his statement to Nicodemus, you must be, bab uh, you must be born of water and of spirit. Uh, he's going to talk about the water of life uh, to the woman at the well. He's going to wash the disciples' feet. And all of these seem implicitly to symbolize the idea of Christian baptism. The bread events in the book of John, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Jesus' statement, I am the bread from heaven, uh, all of those seem to point to the idea of the Eucharistic bread. In fact, uh, Jesus saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. So I would understand uh, John not to be anti-sacramental, uh, but rather John is implicitly talking about sacraments uh, in these events. And perhaps by the end of the first century, John felt like the uh, sort of outward ritual of, of uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper was very well established, but uh, what was really needed was for Christians to understand the inner meaning, the more theological side of what those sacraments pointed toward. Finally, there's the issue of calendar. Uh, the synoptics show the Last Supper of Jesus as a Passover meal. Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples. John, on the other hand, is going to put this a day earlier. In fact, uh, the death of Jesus, not the Last Supper, is going to occur in John's gospel on the day that the lambs are slaughtered. Uh, the the uh, chief priests who are uh, trying to find reason to put Jesus to death don't want to enter Pilate's court so that they will not be defiled and that they might eat the Passover. Well, that then leaves us with this differential of one day. Um, it's interesting that this is reflected in two long-standing traditions of the Christian church. Uh, the Eastern church celebrates Eucharist with leavened bread, and so they follow John's gospel, that the last meal of Jesus with the disciples occurred on the day before the first day of unleavened bread. The Western Church, on the other hand, which would be the Roman Catholic Church and probably most Protestants, are going to celebrate the Lord's table with unleavened bread. And they follow the synoptics that the last meal of Jesus was on the first day of unleavened bread. Well, I suppose someone could suggest that Jesus had two last meals with his disciples, one one night and one the next night with the same group, but that, that doesn't really seem too plausible. Um, uh, a question does sometimes arise, was the meal in the synoptics a true Passover meal? Or was this kind of a private, irregular meal held a day early because Jesus knew that on the next day he would be arrested and executed? Um, maybe, but the term Passover meal is used in the synoptics. Uh, and then the other question uh, or other possibility, which I think is probably uh, the, the more likely one, is that perhaps the Synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel are following a different liturgical calendar among the Jews. Now, we know, for instance, that uh, the Qumran community followed a calendar that was somewhat different than the Jerusalem 
uh, calendar in uh, the temple. Perhaps uh, the synoptics and John are doing the same thing. They're following different calendars. At least this is the uh, suggestion of uh, a couple of scholars, Aramaeus, uh, the great German scholar, and I. Howard Marshall, uh, the, the Scottish scholar. And I, my, my opinion, I think both of them are, are probably on the right track in that suggestion. This is the traditional site of the Last Supper. Uh, we don't actually know this is where the Last Supper took place, but this is the one with the oldest tradition. Um, if you go on a tour to Jerusalem, they're going to take you here and tell you that this was the place of the Last Supper. However, the structure that you see here uh, is not nearly as old as the time of Jesus. You have to remember that Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt several times. Uh, destroyed in AD 70, rebuilt by the Romans, destroyed in AD 130s, rebuilt by the Romans, later destroyed by the Muslims and rebuilt, uh, attacked by the Crusaders, uh, then rebuilt by the Muslims. And so there's been so much dislocation and rebuilding in Jerusalem, it makes archaeological work uh, really quite, quite a challenge. Uh, so in any case, this is uh, the place that is called the Senecal, which is a term that comes from Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And at least the earliest foundations of this structure seem to go back probably to the first century. This is what it looks like inside. Um, the columns uh, go back to an early Byzantine church, so they're not nearly as old as the time of Jesus. The vaulted ceiling was uh, built by Crusaders, so they're uh, you know about a thousand years too late uh, to be from the time of Jesus. So we don't really know whether this is the place where the Last Supper occurred, but um, at least it is the uh, site with the longest standing tradition. Now, <clears throat> in the context of this last meal, Jesus is going to announce to his disciples that it was time for him to leave the world and to return to the Father. And after he says that, he is going to take a basin of water and a towel, and he's going to wash the disciples' feet. Now, there is very sharp contrast here between Jesus, who it says shows to his disciples the full extent of his love, taking the form of a servant. And the opposite side of that would be Judas Iscariot, who already has made arrangements to betray Jesus to death. Uh, so Jesus does assume the role of a servant, and he goes to each of his disciples in turn and washes their feet. Now, you need to remember that this is a formal uh, Jewish uh, meal in which they are reclining to eat. Um, so uh, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, at such a meal, they're not sitting at a table in chairs. They are reclining on cushions on the floor, leaning usually on their left elbow, and then using the right hand to reach into uh, the different parts of the meal. So they are arranged around the food in kind of a sort of a semicircle, uh, and they are lying or reclining on the floor. Uh, that makes it, of course, easy for Jesus to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, he's, not, uh, he's not crawling under the table or something like that. Uh, their feet are stretched out behind them as they recline. And it also helps us to understand how John, the beloved disciple, simply leans back over his shoulder against Jesus' breast. Uh, when I was a little boy, I, I was always confused by that because I had in my mind the, uh, the visual idea of Leonardo da Vinci, who's got them all sitting at a table on one side of the table. Uh, and how did John do that? Did he crawl up in Jesus' lap? Uh, I couldn't figure that out as a kid. But uh, uh, actually, they weren't uh, at chairs at a table. And with all due respect to da Vinci, um, historically, at least, that's not the way the supper proceeded. Uh, Jesus' words to Peter when he comes to him is that, I must wash you. Peter was reluctant. He said, Lord, I, I, I don't want you to wash my feet. It's sort of like John the Baptist who says to Jesus, uh, uh, I don't want to baptize you. It just seems inappropriate uh, because of who you are and who I am. And so Peter says, uh, you know, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. But Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now, that seems to be another one of John's double entendres or double meanings. Uh, on the one hand, it refers to the washing of Peter's feet. 
But on the other hand, it has in view this larger idea of Jesus who is washing him from his sins uh, as the Savior. Um, anyway, the bath of feet seems to symbolize the once for all cleansing from sin. And once you are cleansed from sin, you only need uh, just the periodic cleansing from incidental defilement, sort of the, the dust of the road uh, that might get on you from time to time. Uh, and that is another one of those kinds of uh, sort of double meanings. Now, most Christians have understood the washing of feet and Jesus' statement, you ought to wash one another's feet, as being metaphorical that you should serve each other in the same way Jesus is a servant to his disciples. Some Christians, on the other hand, have understood this as an actual institution of a ritual. So they actually practice the physical washing of feet. Uh, you'll find that in some of the uh, people in the early church, in the medieval church. And in fact, even in the modern world, there are some Christians who practice uh, the ritual of foot washing, usually on uh, Thursday evening of Holy Week. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but as I say, probably the larger portion of Christians uh, uh, do not understand it in quite that way. Well, from the beginning, Jesus has known that Judas Iscariot is going to be unfaithful. Judas is the one who's going to betray him. We probably wonder why Jesus even chose him in the first place. But uh, a long time ago, I decided it's not my place to psychoanalyze God. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that question. But Jesus seems to know from the beginning that Judas will be unfaithful consistently. The fourth gospel portrays Jesus as prompted by the devil. He's called an unbeliever. He's called a devil. He's called unclean. Uh, Satan enters into him, and he is the son of damnation. So those are all very, very strongly negative descriptions of the role of Judas. And then there's this final line in chapter 13 and verse 30 that when Judas leaves the upper room, and of course he leaves before the others do, John says, it was night. Well, it was night in more ways than one. And this is probably another one of those double meanings. True, the sun had gone down, but for Judas, darkness had closed in in a whole spiritual dimension. So this scene uh, of Jesus at the Last Supper is one of the first uh, of several appearances of this expression, the disciple whom Jesus loved. We find it beginning in chapter 13, and it will be mentioned several more times before this gospel is completed. And as I mentioned, his leaning back to ask the identity of the betrayer uh, seems to be uh, consistent with the bodily posture of reclining at a formal meal. There have been efforts to reclaim Judas. Um, one of the most uh, well-known uh, is that uh, that appeared in National Geographic magazine uh, a few years ago in which they paid a million dollars for the right to publish uh, this Gnostic text. I've shown you one uh, papyrus sheet of this Gnostic text, which begins with a statement, uh, the secret account of the revelation that Jesus spoke in conversation with Judas Iscariot a week, three days before he celebrated Passover. Basically what this text is supposed to say is that Jesus and Judas sort of conspired together that Judas would betray him. In other words, Judas was not really against Jesus. He was actually acting at Jesus' own instruction. Uh, of course, this uh, was brought out just uh, before Easter back in 2006 and claimed to give insight into the true story of Jesus and Judas. Um, well, no. Uh, actually, the Gnostic literature has written decades after there were any living witnesses to the life and ministry of Jesus, while the canonical Gospels, including the Gospel of John, were written within the lifetime of those who had known Jesus personally. So the level of trust that you should put in the synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John is exponentially higher than anything you should put into Gnostic literature that was written a half a century later. Well, when Judas departs, Jesus once more turns to the theme of glorification. And that, of course, is speaking of his passion and is being lifted up on the cross. And in that context, he is going to predict that Peter will betray him. Um, 
when he talks about glorification, it is interesting that the fourth gospel uses this aorist passive is glorified. Now is the son of man glorified. Uh, the aorist passive nuance in Greek seems to be used in order to state what is actually happening, but with a certitude of something that has already happened. Uh, you may or may not be a Greek reader, but uh, I, I do think that the aorist passive that is used here is probably theologically significant to underscore the certitude of what is happening. At least in this commandment, Jesus gives the new commandment that the disciples should love each other just as he has loved them. In fact, uh, this is where we get the language of Monday Thursday, uh, the Thursday of Holy Week. Uh, Monday Thursday actually is derived from the idea of mandate, and the new commandment that Jesus gives, or the mandate that he gives, is that they should love each other as he has loved them. Uh, because of that commandment, Christians have celebrated the Thursday of Holy Week in a variety of ways, but one that um, I have always found very uh, uh, very uh, uh, confirming uh, is when different Christians from different churches get together to celebrate uh, the new commandment in a Monday Thursday service. I know as an evangelical pastor myself in uh, the area of Detroit, uh, the church that I pastored used to uh, celebrate Monday Thursday with uh, uh, either a Lutheran church or Presbyterian church, uh, once with a Roman Catholic church, uh, once with an Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, once with uh, a Baptist Church, uh, once with a Pentecostal Church. Uh, but basically, it's a way of affirming uh, others who are part of the larger community of Christians and to express to them love in the same way that Christ expressed his love for us. Well, <clears throat> when Jesus told Peter that he would uh, would betray him or deny him, Peter Peter doesn't think that's possible. Peter says, Lord, I, I'm willing to die for you. I think Peter meant that. I think Peter was honestly sincere when he said that. Uh, but Jesus knew more about Peter than Peter knew about himself. And Jesus did predict that Peter would disown him three times before morning. And of course, that is going to happen. And that brings us then to this last great discourse. Uh, the discourse that talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, there are some critical questions about this discourse that we also need to address at the beginning. For one thing, this is the longest discourse in the fourth gospel. But one of the critical questions we have to address is how is Jesus talking to his disciples? In other words, does he view them as the 12 apostles, uh, kind of a unique group? Or does he view them as being the uh, uh, sort of the progenitors of the later Christian church? So if they're addressed as a unique group, then they would be addressed as those who had been Jesus, uh, with Jesus in his ministry from the time of the baptism of John. They would be the eyewitnesses of his death and resurrection. And in that sense, they would be serving in a non-repeatable ministry. In other words, you have the 12 apostles, but we don't have any people who serve in their role in the later history of the church because none of them uh, was alive when Jesus was in his earthly ministry. These 12 are special in that sense. On the other hand, Jesus may be addressing them as the first Christians so that what he says to them uh, implicitly applies to all Christians, even Christians in the 21st century. And, of course, there's the possibility that Jesus has both of these in mind and that the two audiences are sort of intermingled or they overlap each other. Uh, this is uh, sort of the passages that you need to consider uh, in answering this question. Uh, some things that are said by Jesus do seem to address the disciples as a unique group. For instance, he says, you have been with me from the beginning. Well, that's pretty much a statement that's locked into the 12 apostles, but cannot be repeated some time later in the history of the Christian church. No one can say that, that they have been with Jesus personally from the beginning. Jesus also says to them, you will be expelled from the synagogue. Well, at the very least, that has to refer to Jewish Christians 
uh, it doesn't refer to the larger body of Gentile Christians who eventually will come to faith in Christ. Uh, he's going to talk about the grief or sorrow that they would experience between the time when Jesus was crucified and when he was risen from the dead. So that weekend, which was such a dark weekend for uh, the disciples, that seems to refer to them as a unique group. And finally, he's going to say to them that all of them will abandon him. And in fact, they all did. They all will, after Jesus' arrest, they're all going to scatter. Uh, so that seems to talk to them as a unique group. On the other hand, there are some very important passages that seem uh, applicable to the Christian church in a much larger sense than just the 12 in their earthly life. For instance, Jesus promises that he is going to the Father's house and he's going to prepare a place. And where he goes, they are going to be able to come too. Now, Christians pretty much since the day one have understood this ref to refer to uh, uh, as a promise to all Christians. In fact, we typically read this passage at the, at the funeral of a believer. Uh, Jesus says, I'm going away, but where I'm going, I'm preparing a place for you and you can come and be with me where I am. Uh, in addition to that, you have Jesus talking about himself as the way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, that certainly seems to apply in general to people who come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the new commandment that we should love each other. That's certainly not something that is exclusive just to the 12. That's something that Christians should be doing today as much as they were doing it in the first century. And then finally, there is the promise of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Comforter. That, again, seems to be a broad promise to the whole Christian church, not just to the 12 apostles. So with those two kinds of ideas in mind, you find that different passages in this last discourse of Jesus may be handled in different ways depending on how they are reading it. For instance, Christians will differ concerning how to apply the passages about performing greater works. Jesus said, you will do greater works than I have done. Well, what does that mean? Um, does that mean the apostle will do more uh, majestic miracles than Jesus? Um, kind of hard to imagine a more majestic miracle than healing a man who was born blind or raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, I'm inclined to think that the greater works have to do with the scope of ministry in the early church in which they will reach beyond the boundaries of Jewishness to the larger Gentile world. So they would be greater in the sense of their scope. But at least this would be the kind of thing where, where interpreters are going to have to decide how are you going to read that passage? Are you going to read it as a unique group passage or are you going to read it as a passage that is for the whole Christian church? In this discourse, Jesus is going to talk about the Father's house, which is a unique expression. We often use the word heaven, but the Father's house sounds a lot more uh, familial, uh, sort of like going home. Uh, and so he's going to talk about the Father's house as a place of many rooms. Now, if you grew up... Uh, reading the King James Version, for instance, or one of the older English versions, you may be familiar with the language, many mansions. Um, unfortunately, the Greek word that is used here isn't a word that usually is used to describe some sort of palace or something like that. Uh, so uh, in spite of the fact that there are songs that talk about build my mansion next door to Jesus and so on, um, <clears throat> I think many rooms is, is, is a much better translation. Uh, it basically means there are many places in the Father's house for those who believe in Jesus. And in going there, Jesus would make it possible for the disciples to follow later. I am going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. You know the way, Jesus said. Well, Philip says, oh, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How do we know the way? But of course, the way is not in a map because it's not a piece of geography uh, in the sense of trying to, trying to find your way uh, by some sort of road, but it is in fact in a person. Jesus says, I am the way. 
or I am the road. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But if I go away, I will come again, and I will accept you to myself and take you personally to the Father's house. And there is no other way to the Father except through me. Well, the theme of the disciples trusting Christ between his death and resurrection is sort of a microcosm of what will later happen to Christians who are waiting for Jesus after he is ascended into heaven, but has promised that he will come again. And so what happens on the weekend of Jesus' death is sort of a mirror of what will happen for all Christians through the church age. They will not see Jesus personally during that time, but they are awaiting when he will appear. On Sunday morning of Resurrection Day, Jesus appears to his disciples, and by the same token, at the end of the age, Christians will have Jesus appear to them the second time. So throughout this discourse, then you have these phrases. I'm going away. I will come back. In a little while, you'll see me no more. And after a little while, you will see me. All of these are kind of double meaning statements, uh, partly referring to what will happen on that weekend, but partly referring what would happen throughout the period of the church age. Now, of course, no one knows how long the church age will last. And from their point of view, uh, I don't know that they had any conception that it would be lasting a couple of thousand years. But nonetheless, they did seem to have this idea that they would be waiting for Jesus to appear at his second coming. And so this, this kind of language describes what the apostles would experience over the weekend, but what Christians would experience over the whole age of the church. But either way, the followers of Jesus must trust him. He said he would come back and he would appear, and they must trust that he is telling them the truth. Now, in a previous lecture, we talked about this word perichoresis. This is a, 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 a Greek expression that basically means interpenetration. And it comes from these sayings of Jesus where he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. We ran into that in the last lecture. We run into it here again in this discourse of Jesus, where he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Uh, Jesus then is the full expression of the Father's nature, so that when the disciples see Jesus, they do in fact see the Father. There is a rather um, unfortunate uh, expression that sometimes you find where people seem to think that God in the Old Testament is rather different than God in the New Testament. Um, there was uh, an, an early a uh, Christian leader in Rome called Marcion, who actually uh, tried to do away with the Old Testament um, uh, because he felt like the God of the Old Testament was incompatible with the Father of Jesus Christ. Uh, that seems to be altogether unnecessary, and uh, I think that's a huge mistake. In fact, I think the early church was, in fact, uh, exactly right when they accepted the Hebrew Bible as a Christian document that the Hebrew Bible is the Old Testament, and now we have added to that the New Testament, and together they make the Christian scriptures. Uh, but what Jesus says is that he has come to make the Father known. When you see Jesus, you see what the Father is like. Jesus says, when you see me, you see the Father. Um, Philip had asked, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus said, you've seen me. If you've seen me, you've seen what the Father is like. So there is not some sort of discrepancy between God in the Old Testament and the Father of Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus, in fact, comes to make known the God of the Old Testament, which is, in fact, his Father. So those kinds of statements that Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me, this is not just a dwelling Christology. This is not just a way of saying Jesus was a spirit-filled human. Uh, there have been some expressions uh, in the history of Christianity which have kind of tended that way. I mentioned uh, in a previous lecture Sabellianism. Uh, there's also Apollinarianism, uh, Nestorianism uh, in the 20th century, uh, the birth of oneness Pentecostalism. Uh, all of these are groups which would not 
accept the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is both fully God, but he is also able to be distinguished from the Father. Uh, uh, so uh, I guess I'm in, in short, I'm saying that the statements that Jesus makes here in the Gospel of John seem to me to be fully compatible with what later Christians are going to call the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus can even say, I and my Father are one, but he never says, I am the Father. So the testimony of the gospel, of, or the fourth gospel, is that Jesus is the unique Son of God. He is the only Son of God. He is God's Son in a special, unique way, and he is both fully divine and fully human. Jesus uh, commands the apostles to ask in my name, and that rests upon the idea that he's going to return to the Father. When I return to the Father, you can ask in my name. Now, the whole idea here is that Jesus ascends into heaven, and he becomes the mediator between humans and God. Uh, the reason we ask the Father in the name of Jesus is because Jesus is the one who came from heaven to earth and is now going to go from earth back to the Father. And because of that, he is the mediator between ourselves and God. He's the only one who has done this, so he's the only one who has authority to offer this kind of access to God. So if the apostles were to ask anything, they must do so in the name of Jesus or through the name of the Son. Um, when you look at the prayers in the New Testament and in the letters of Paul and other writers of the New Testament, you find a number of prayers. Invariably, they are described as prayers to the Father in the name of the Son. Uh, there are not, in fact, direct prayers to the Holy Spirit. Uh, occasionally in modern Christianity, you find people addressing the Holy Spirit in prayer. I don't know that I would say that is inappropriate because the Holy Spirit is God too, but at least you don't ever find that in the New Testament. In the New Testament, all prayers are directed to the Father in the name of the Son. So before Jesus returns to the Father and completes his incarnational work, uh, it would not be possible for the disciples to pray to the Father in quite that same way because Jesus has not yet ascended back to the Father. But now that he is ascending back to the Father, they are able to address the Father in the name of the Son as their mediator. And in fact, they are able to ask for greater things. And as I mentioned before, I would understand this idea of greater things to be their mission to the whole world to bear fruit. Now, a large portion of the last discourse of Jesus is going to have to do with the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit certainly was active throughout the ministry of Jesus in a number of ways, but Jesus is very clear that the Messianic gift of the Spirit had not been broadly bestowed upon his disciples and could not have, have been so bestowed until Jesus, in fact, had risen from the dead or had been glorified as it says in John chapter 7. So Jesus promises that after he ascends back to the Father, he will give to them another Holy Spirit. What he says is he will give them another paraclete. Uh, paraclete. Uh, the, the Greek term alon parakleton uh, is a Greek term that means another comforter. And I'm going to come back to this word comforter in a moment because it's a little tricky how to translate that word. Uh, we often, uh, in English at least, just call it paraclete, uh, which is basically a transliteration. And in some ways, this, uh, this Holy Spirit that is coming is going to be uh, uh, very similar to Jesus. In fact, in a sense, is Jesus himself. Jesus says, I will not leave you without comfort. I will come to you. And yet in some ways, it is different than Jesus himself. Jesus is visible uh, in his presence with the disciples, whereas the Holy Spirit will not be visible in that same way. So translators have struggled to capture exactly what kind of an English term best suits this Greek term parakletos. 
Uh, if you go back into the old English versions, like the King James Version, they're going to translate it as comforter. And that's, a, that's an appropriate uh, translation. Um, the, the term parakletos is basically made up of two words. It's, it's made up of a preposition, para, uh, which means alongside. And then it's made up of a verb, kaleo, which means to call. So to call someone alongside or basically the idea that you were called to assist someone else. Many times the term parakletos is used in a legal sense to refer to an attorney or a lawyer. Uh, this is why a number of translations are going to translate this as advocate. Uh, so you see the New Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, a number of versions are going to use the word advocate. Some will use the word helper, uh, such as the ESV. Uh, a couple of the Roman Catholic translations, the New American Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible, are going to simply just use the word paraclete. Uh, they don't try to find an English equivalent. They just uh, use this transliteration. So uh, you're going to see some variety uh, of translation about this word. But basically, this means uh, someone who is called alongside you to assist you, to help you. And that is what this Holy Spirit is going to do. Jesus is also going to talk about the vine and the branches. Now, the vine is the traditional symbol of the Jewish nation. In fact, that goes at least as far back as, as Isaiah chapter 5, in which he gets the parable of the vineyard, and Israel is the vineyard of the Lord. And you find that same kind of idea in other prophets as well. So when Jesus said, I am the vine, or I am the true vine, he is giving us another one of those ego a me sayings, these emphatic statements, I am the true vine. And he seems to be announcing that he is the, the source of a new community that must find its life in him. Now, in a number of ways, Jesus has suggested that uh, he and his followers are the nucleus of a new way of understanding Israel. Uh, he chose 12 to be his apostles, and that, of course, seems to be a deliberate parallel with the ancient 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, he is going to talk about a new temple, uh, the old temple on uh, that, that would be built in Jerusalem or that stood in Jerusalem, uh, as opposed to uh, the temple the Samaritans built on Mount Gerizim. That whole issue is now uh, a dead issue. There is a new way of worship, a new kind of temple. In fact, Jesus said he is himself the new temple. And he gives the true manna, the true bread from heaven. Uh, so that suggests that there is a new kind of Israel. And finally, there is the water ritual at the festival of booze, where Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his inner being will flow rivers of living water. But that he said with reference to the Holy Spirit, which would be given later. So Jesus is, is appealing to this, this long-standing metaphor of the Jewish nation, the vine, but he's saying, I am the vine. I am the source of life. Now, as uh, we've already mentioned, Jesus does not describe the Eucharistic words of Jesus. Uh, I'm sorry, John does not describe the Eucharistic words of Jesus. He doesn't describe the breaking of the bread or the sharing of the cup. But if Jesus gave this teaching on the vine immediately following what the, the, the synoptic gospel describes as the sharing of the cup, then the disciples would naturally have linked those two things together. I am the vine is linked with the Eucharistic words, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I would suggest this is probably the way you should read this statement, I am the vine, that is linked to what has just happened in the Eucharistic words and actions of Jesus. One thing does seem to be clear, the primary teaching on the vine was relational and task oriented. So the disciples have been called to bear fruit, but if they're going to bear fruit, they are going to have to be connected to the vine because the, the vine is the life giving source that gives them the power uh, to produce fruit. So if they're going to succeed in their calling, then they must depend entirely upon Jesus. So their calling is to bear fruit. Uh, if they are good branches, they will be pruned so that they can bear even more fruit. 
And if they don't bear any fruit, they are dead branches and they will be cut off. But all of this again points to the idea that Jesus is the source of life for this new community. So Jesus says to his, his disciples, he says, uh, I am no longer calling you servants. I, I, I'm calling you friends. You're my friends. You are partners in my mission from the Father. And if that is true, it is equally true that the world into which I have come and the world into which I am sending you is a hostile world. Don't, don't be surprised about this. The world is going to hate you. So when John speaks of the world or the cosmos, which is the Greek term, uh, as we talked about earlier, he's speaking of that community or that culture that is estranged from God. He's not speaking of the, uh, of the universe in general, particularly speaking of the world of humans, a world that is under condemnation. Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world because the world already was condemned. Uh, in fact, he's going to say that even the unbelieving Jewish community is part of that world system that is estranged from God. They will expel Christians from the synagogue. So you may have been excused for ignorance in the past, but not any longer. And if you reject Jesus, then you are implicitly rejecting the Father as well. You cannot accept Jesus without accepting the Father, but if you accept Jesus, you are in fact accepting the Father. And so the presence of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is going to send is going to uphold them and defend them and lead them into truth. So Jesus is going to talk about this greater mission that is to be accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the paraclete. The Spirit is going to indict the unbelieving world for its sin and unbelief. The Holy Spirit is going to vindicate Jesus as God's righteous son. Even though he is sentenced to death and is crucified on the cross, in the resurrection, the Spirit vindicates Jesus as God's righteous son. And he is going to convince the world of the condemnation of Satan. Because in his death and resurrection, Jesus will defeat the powers of evil and the powers of the devil. So altogether, this is a combination of ideas that Jesus said, you, you, you probably aren't going to get all this in one evening. Um, you cannot understand this all now. Uh, too much uh, uh, in, in, uh, to assimilate for you, for you in this one evening. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring back to your memory everything I've said to you, and he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He will make my meaning clear to you. I think one of the most important things that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit is that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me. That means that whatever someone says is a work of the Holy Spirit. If it does not lead you directly back to the teachings of Jesus and Jesus himself, then we have every reason to question whether that is really the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not like, I don't know, not like Star Wars, may the force be with you. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not just, uh, just a force. The Holy Spirit is someone. It is the person of the Holy Spirit, and the person of the Holy Spirit is going to testify of Jesus. He's going to bring to your memory the things that Jesus taught. So you can't disconnect the work of the Holy Spirit from the teaching of Jesus. Well, this theme of seeing Jesus no more is, of course, the background for Easter faith. Uh, and you're going to find that ultimately uh, all believers are going to need to believe in Jesus, even if they have not seen him. Uh, uh, Jesus has returned to the Father, and we are left in the midst of this interim period of time when we are waiting for him to appear again. But in that interim time, we have the gift of the Spirit. So the interval between Jesus' death and resurrection on that ancient weekend is going to be a time of terrible loss for the disciples. They will face the darkest days of their life over that weekend. Jesus is crucified. He is buried. And they probably thought it was the end of their hopes. 
but then they would be filled with overwhelming joy when they saw him again risen from the dead. And that temporary loss would be erased by the unrestricted power and grace of Jesus risen from the dead and eventually ascended to the Father. So by his return to the Father, Jesus would make possible this direct and intimate access to God so that believers can pray directly to the Father in the name of the Son. The gift of the Spirit and the authority to ask in the name of Christ later is going to be linked to the prayer for forgiveness. Jesus is going to say to the apostles, uh, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. So it's linked to that idea uh, of the prayer for forgiveness. So now the incarnational mission is almost complete. Jesus is now at the end of his public ministry and now at the end of his private words with the disciples. What remains is he will be offering a final prayer. He will go with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. He will be arrested and he will face his passion. And we will be looking at that passion in the final lecture on the Gospel of John.